Um, so welcome, thank you guys for, for coming to this talk today on interstitial lung disease with a focus on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We'll have three talks that will go through very briefly kind of the diagnosis, where we are currently with therapy, and where are we gonna be with therapy down the road in terms of, of ongoing clinical trials. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Deciphering the Difference Between Idiopathic Pulmonary Fibrosis and Other Interstitial Lung Diseases, Accurate Diagnosis and Optimal Therapy. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash CZM. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. All right, so I'm gonna kick things off uh, in the first of these three talks, talking a little bit about the approach and diagnosis of patients with interstitial lung disease. And we'll start with a hypothetical case. So we'll start with Brian. Brian is 75 years old and presents with symptoms of cough and breathlessness. Former smoker, has an astute primary care physician who notices that there's some crackles in the left base, on radiograph, the lung is clear, no perfusions in pneumothorax, maybe some cardiomegaly and lingular atelectasis versus an infiltrate. So cough, breathlessness, and crackles. I think obviously we've got our own differential diagnoses going here in a, in a pulmonary meeting, but I think if we look towards our primary care colleagues that we interact with, having them think about interstitial lung diseases in this scenario is, is probably one of the bigger educational things that we can do. If, mild symptoms of cough and shortness of breath and crackles, think of interstitial lung disease. Uh, so interstitial lung diseases are difficult. A large group of many different disorders, they have similar symptoms, similar physiology, radiographs often overlap, and the nomenclature is extremely hard, this alphabet soup of all these acronyms that we throw along. So how do we try to chunk up these hundreds of dis different disorders? Well, we try to make them into smaller groups. We have a large group that's idiopathic, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about how do we get that group down to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But we think about other things, and this is where our clinical evaluation is most critical. Is there an underlying systemic disorder? Is there an autoimmune disease? Am I dealing with rheumatoid arthritis, with systemic sclerosis, where my approach to therapy is going to be at those underlying diseases? Is this some hobby or exposure or work that my patient is, is inhaling, and that's leading to the lung disease? Is it something that we're doing? Is this a medication reaction? Have they been on amiodarone? Have they been on macrodantin? Infectious, heart failure masquerading as interstitial lung disease or others. So we look at these broad group of interstitial lung disease and then we try to chunk it into smaller groups to make it more and more digestible. When we end up with a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, one specific entity out of these hundreds of different types of interstitial lung disease, that requires two things. Beyond a reasonable doubt, we've excluded other causes of interstitial lung disease. And that's more of a process than just a one-time experiment. Because things can change over time. I think most of us have had a patient that we thought was idiopathic, and then years down the road, their serologies are positive, and they now have a lot of joint symptoms, and it turns out that maybe the lungs were the first manifestation of their autoimmune disease. Or they come up with an exposure that didn't come out in the initial history. So exclusion of other known causes of ILD is really more of a process that goes on over time but is critical in terms of, of knowing if this is IPF or others. Once you've excluded other causes, then it comes down to can we find this pattern that we call usual interstitial pneumonia, either radiographically on a high resolution CT scan, or when the CT scan is subtle or mild or looks a little funny, do we see it under the microscope in the form of a surgical lung biopsy? Idiopathic usual interstitial pneumonia is what we talk about as IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And we can think of a flow chart. So this is Fernando's work. You start with a patient that you've suspected interstitial lung disease or suspected possible idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Can you find a cause? If you can, it's not IPF anymore, and you direct therapy towards removing that cause or treating that cause. If you can't find something, well, what does the CT look like? If it's idiopathic and the CT shows a pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia, you're done. You've made the diagnosis of IPF. But if it doesn't, then you have to say, well, what's the risks and benefits? Do I need to do a surgical lung biopsy to look under the microscope? And again, find out if under the microscope is this UIP or something other to make that diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm not sure how well these project, 
But these would be the two big categories that we think about on CT scan trying to lead us down a path towards idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. On the top panel is what we would say is, is HRCT definite criteria for UIP. No one's going to argue that this is a UIP pattern if you find these features on a CT scan. So the distribution is subpleural, basilar predominant, there's reticular lines, but the key is that you have honeycombing. Around the periphery, these little cysts that look like a bee's honeycombing line up along the periphery. That pattern, when you have nothing else there that's funny, you don't have a lot of ground glass or cysts or other things, nodules that, that would say, well, what else might be going on? That pattern is usual interstitial pneumonia. It doesn't equal IPF unless it's usual interstitial pneumonia that's idiopathic. The next row, I think, is a row that we're evolving on, and this is this kind of possible UIP pattern, where the distribution is correct, you have reticular lines, you have some traction bronchiectasis, but you don't have honeycombing. When we've looked at these cases, about two out of three will have UIP under the microscope, but one in three may have NSIP or other features. And it's in this group here that currently we still recommend considering the risks and benefits of a biopsy, but as I'll show you in a few minutes, I think we're starting to understand this group a little bit better in terms of other demographic features that can increase our probability that UIP is there and maybe save a biopsy in some patients. We certainly know from some of the impulsus data, post hoc analyses, that groups of patients that were called IPF that have these two types of CT scans, at least in the tentative trials, behaved identically. So in terms of disease behavior, they look like they react very similarly. Another pattern, NSIP. This looks a little different, right? There's more ground glass, maybe some subpleural sparing. The key is there is no honeycombing. So when honeycombing is there, it leads us towards UIP. When it's not, could be NSIP, or as I showed you in the last slide, could still be usual interstitial pneumonia under histopathology. And then hypersensitivity pneumonia, maybe more diffuse in nature, ground glass, maybe some micronodules, areas of air trapping that look like mosaicism. Again, it looks different than that first slide where we were thinking of definite or possible usual interstitial pneumonia. What does Brian's CT look like? All right, so he's kind of in that possible UIP pattern. It's in the right distribution. These are lower lobe cuts. There's traction bronchiectasis, but there's no honeycombing. So what do we do with Brian, right? He's 75 years old. He's got mild symptoms of cough and shortness of breath, and he has this CT scan. So a couple groups have looked at this. Margaret Salisbury is, uh, was one of my fellows, and she's now on faculty at Michigan in our ILD clinic. Looked at age. Turns out if you get older or you have more reticulation but still without honeycombing, the odds of you having usual interstitial pneumonia under the microscope start to go up, and not even in a linear fashion, more logarithmically, more exponentially. So is there a cutoff there? Is there some age criteria? Maybe it's 65, maybe it's 70, maybe it's our patient Brian who's 75 where you can say, listen, the, the odds are that this is UIP, even without honeycombing, I don't need to do a biopsy. And the San Francisco group looked at it in a similar fashion, coming up with a scoring system. Again, age played a key component to this, males more than females, and then they looked at a bronchiectasis score, looked at each of the different lobes and scored them from zero to three or four and got point systems. And when you had traction bronchiectasis in multiple lobes, in a patient who is older, in a patient who is male, you can see that as your score goes up, your probability that what you're dealing with is UIP also goes up. So these are areas that I think are evolving, and we'll see down the road in a few years if we become more comfortable as a community calling patients with a possible UIP that meets certain demographic characteristics, UIP, IPF, without subjecting them to a surgical and biopsy. We talk about putting this together in context. These are hard patterns to recognize individually, we work together as groups with our radiologists, with our pathologists, to try to see if there's any subtleties that are there that can help us make the best diagnosis at the end of the day, this multidisciplinary team diagnosis. One way to potentially look at that is, well, if we make that diagnosis, do things behave similarly? So these are Simon Walsh's data looking at different types of diagnosis, separating IPF from others, with the MDT perhaps doing a little bit better than clinicians or radiologists working independently. So, we get back to Brian. His HRCT showed possible UIP. He went to MDT discussion, and the overall decision was that he had a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And now Brian's going to come back to clinic, and we're going to talk to him about therapeutic options. So what we're going to do is basically take the um, very broad picture that we started with and kind of hone that down and help us define IPF and 
and how to treat patients better. And Fernando will then take that a little bit further and look further at the data and, and the future in IPF therapy. So let's start with Joe as our first case. He's 82 years old and Caucasian male with shortness of breath on exertion. He has a mild cough, a little bit of morning sputum production, but no other pulmonary symptoms of wheezing or chest pain. His activities of daily living are not limited at all. He's still able to do what he wants to do and walks one to two miles three to four times per week with his dogs. No infectious signs or symptoms, and he has a good appetite and stable weight, and that's important as we consider therapies. Part of the evaluation that we're doing is we're getting an injury pattern, which is most of the time comes to us through uh, imaging. Uh, a lot of times we'll get symptoms, shortness of breath, crackles on exam that give us sort of a question of an injury pattern uh, in, on exam in history when we see patients. But we're taking this injury pattern of usual interstitial pneumonitis and trying to figure out what caused it. So when we can't find the cause, then we're able to label it idiopathic. But we want to rule out those things that can be part of the cause of that same injury pattern. And that's, we've got to rule out autoimmune disease. We've got to rule out certain exposures in the occupational world um, and environment. Uh, birds, something that may cause a chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And we want to rule out toxic drugs. Pneumotox.com can be very helpful to us in that regard. So Joe had no signs of autoimmune disease. He had an ANA that was 1 to 160, but never panned out any signs or symptoms that would be able to make a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease. He was a retired Navy pilot and uh, worked testing planes for a defense contractor uh, for years after he was in the Navy. No significant exposures, inhalational exposures in the, in the workforce, uh, such as asbestos, no drug toxicity, no bird exposure. Joe's past medical history is uh, notable for the following, but I mainly want to highlight that he's got two comorbidities, at least of uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and that includes obstructive sleep apnea and reflux. And we'll talk a little bit further about that and highlight just a few of the comorbidities of pulmonary fibrosis. So let's start with reflux. A uh, lot more information coming out on this, yet we're only at the tip of the iceberg of understanding what happens when things spill in the lungs. And our response to that uh, spillage into the lungs from either reflux or aspiration of from above can be very unique depending on our body's own way of dealing with uh, wound repair. So Ganesh Raghu in uh, the mid-2000s looked at about 50 patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and performed manometry and pH probe on these patients and found uh, that 90% of patients had gastroesophageal reflux by monitoring. But only half, really less than half, 47% were symptomatic. So I think that gives us a big clue is that we can't just use symptoms alone to determine whether or not our patients have reflux. And certainly if reflux is a risk factor and possibly causative to the injury pattern that we're seeing, we're want to, going to want to maximally manage that. So think about in your patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease in general, getting a full reflux evaluation on those patients who can tolerate it and are not too hypoxic. Interestingly, he looked at uh, uh, their pH, 24-hour pH probes and found that 12 of the 19 patients that were actually on proton pump inhibitors during that 24-hour monitoring still had an abnormal acid exposure. So it begs the question, are we maximally managing these patients? We're also concerned about non-acid reflux, too, because the proton pump inhibitors, all they do is um, decrease your acid exposure, but they don't stop the juices from coming back up. So what happens to people when they have non-acid exposure? Joyce Lee retrospectively looked at patients who were on proton pump inhibitors and asked the question, is survival different, and found that survival was improved in patients um, who were on uh, acid blockade. So what about sleep apnea and how is that linked in? So I want you to think about sleep apnea just as breathing at nighttime. 
it's a little bit of a misnomer. Majority of sleep disorder breathing that we see is, is hypopnea related, so shallow breathing spells with the desaturation. And that desaturation is probably that element that is the pathologic promoter, the pro-inflammatory um, mechanism, the pro-hormonal release of cortisol and a lot of other problems that uh, sleep disorder breathing cause, causes. But the obstruction can occur anywhere from the back of the throat to the upper trachea because it's a very floppy airway. And as we get older, unfortunately, tissues get a little bit floppier. So our risk factors for sleep apnea, interestingly enough, overlap with our comorbidities for pulmonary fibrosis. And especially, um, there's an interesting link with uh, reflux, or association rather. And as the upper airway occludes at night, it creates negative pressure in the chest, and that negative pressure can worsen nocturnal reflux, especially in the supine position. And there's data actually from the gastroenterologist that shows that treating sleep apnea helps lessen nocturnal reflux at night by pH probe measurements. So when you see your patients that are older, Think about more unusual symptoms and not the classic symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. You may see the witness apnea, the gasnea, gasping, choking, morning headaches, excessive daytime sleepiness, but those are more rare in this patient population. Usually there are maybe mood disturbances, frequently getting up at nighttime, uh, nocturia that we always blame on the prostate is uh, very common as well too. So look for that patient with fragmented sleep or some sleep maintenance insomnia. About 50% may have that. So how does that link with this disease? How does the physiology of IPF possibly link with obstructive sleep apnea? And likely links by reduced lung volumes. From animal models, we've found that decreases in lung volumes result in upper airway um, uh, laxity or easy closure. Um, same thing can happen in obesity, too. We reduce our lung volumes with obesity, and it's worse in the supine position. So we looked at 50 uh, patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, did questionnaires and nocturnal polysomnograms on all of them, and found that 88% of those patients had obstructive sleep apnea, and that's been echoed in a few other studies as well. One of my fellows, Olivia Giddings, uh, took those patients who then went on to CPAP therapy and asked the question, well, if you're compliant with your CPAP therapy versus non-compliant with your CPAP therapy, how does that help you and does that affect survival? So in this retrospective study, biased by the fact we were looking at compliant versus non-compliant patients, um, we didn't have a death in the compliant group until year five, which was really um, surprising. Oxygenation during sleep, the dips can be dramatic, and that's echoed in these two studies that showed that sleep oxygen desaturation exceeds desaturation with exercise and even maximal exertion. And not too surprisingly, that what panned out to be worse than one of the studies in patients who had obstructive sleep apnea. So back to Joe. Um, his social history, he was a never smoker, uh, but some passive smoke exposure, one to two drinks per week. Uh, he liked to play golf and was still active doing that. No family history of pulmonary fibrosis, cirrhosis, or bone marrow disease. We'll ask about that a little bit more because of the association with uh, telomerase mutations. And uh, his medications were not too surprising, and he was on a proton pump inhibitor. His physical exam was remarkable for a body mass index of 29.1, faint by basilar crackles, and he had no clubbing. In the past, before he came to see us, he had had a non-diagnostic bronchoscopy uh, out of concern initially for concurrent infection. He had a six-minute walk test and did a good job. He walked um, almost 1,500 feet with a satinator of 91%. He had mild restriction and a reduction in DLCO of 51%. And these are his uh, CT scan findings. So you'll notice he's got uh, bronchiectasis, he's got some honeycomb change, and it goes all the way down to the deep sulci. So let's look at the data for nintetinib and perfenidone. And I think the biggest take-home message here is that for both medications, 
we do see a continued decline downward. And they slow the rate of decline uh, about 50% or so for both therapies. So it's wonderful in this area of pulmonary fibrosis to have choices, and now we have two. So for nintetinib, the difference between the placebo group and the treatment arm was a delta of 111 milliliters per year. And then for perfinidone, the delta was a difference of 148 um, milliliters over the course of 12 months. So what did Joe decide to do? Well, he chose one of the FDA-approved therapies, but we also need to remember we need to treat the other issues of his pulmonary fibrosis and not just focus on medicines. But this is really, there's a, a global piece of care to this. We want to monitor for infections. We need to assess their oxygen needs at each visit with exertion, at rest, and with sleep. So there should be three different numbers that the patient's aware of, and that's gonna, going to modulate with time because we should be measuring that and assessing that over time as their disease progresses. Because even on therapy, you can see the natural course is a disease progression. Living causes a disease, well, not disease progression, but a progression of decline in your pulmonary function testing. You, you lose about 1,900 milliliters of force vital capacity from age 18. Um, to age 85. So keep that one in mind. There is no true stable in, um, in life when it comes to force vital capacity. Keep vaccinations up to date. Um, we plan to do pulmonary rehab. He was on CPAP therapy and continued that, continued his reflux precautions, proton pump inhibitor. He was trying to lose a little weight. Body mass index was uh, mildly elevated at 29. And uh, we tr worked on treating his other comorbidities that may contribute to shortness of breath because we have some latitude and impact there as well, too. And with each visit, we continued our discussion of disease state education, updates on therapies, and on clinical trials. So I strongly encourage you to send your patients to IPF uh, Centers of Excellence, uh, identified through the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, um, you'll know and recognize the centers near you, and that can help your patients uh, not just get evaluated for clinical trials, but inappropriate candidates for lung transplant. So there are some issues when we think about our elderly patients that um, may be a bit more challenging, and we may not want to necessarily consider therapies for these patients with more um, advanced disease resulting in there being bed-bound, survival less than a year, um, uh, other severe medical diseases that may, uh, such as cancers, that may uh, significantly shorten their life or cause their medical regimens to be very complicated. There's polypharmacy, so and helping these patients uh, with their medicines and ensuring that they can take a complicated medical regimen. Uh, two to three times a day is important. We have to think about their comorbidities uh, as well, too. With nintetinib, there is VEGF inhibition and a theoretic um, risk of easy bleeding or easy clotting. So we keep that in mind. And if we have patients at high risk for any of those, we may choose an alternative uh, therapy to that. But we just need more data to know if uh, anticoagulation is a problem in these patients or not, or if there is a drug interaction there. Uh, neither drug was studied in patients with uh, end-stage or chronic kidney disease at elevated stages or in liver disease. It's important to monitor the liver enzymes in these patients, although there are new indications that we just get a baseline uh, liver enzymes and ensure they're normal in patients with, uh, who are on nintetinib, and then it's at the physician's discretion after that. Uh, generally, with perfrenidone, we monitor once a month for six months and then every three months after that. Um, but the uh, incidence of uh, liver enzyme abnormality was low at around uh, 3% or so. Um, we follow their GI symptoms, weight loss, appetite. Fatigue is common in IPF, but also with perfenidone therapy. Make sure you look for other causes, anemia, sleep apnea, thyroid disease that may be contributing to that or may be causing that. And uh, monitor concomitant medications for drug interaction, uh, Cipro with, uh, uh, probably more common with uh, 
profenadone. There are lots of alternatives out there to that medication. So Joe progressed. Um, and the important thing to understand is that these medications slow disease progression. Data with nintetinib and data with profenadone both show that uh, patients' continued uh, progression is decreased after a first decline of greater than 10% during the first six months with profenadone, and there's some stabilization after that. And with nintetinib, there is a maintained uh, effect to the drug um, at least for two years. So Joe progressed, and what did we decide to do with him? Well, we don't know what his natural course would be because we can't understand what he would naturally, his natural decline would be at that point, and we know that patients are going to progress on therapy, and how we define treatment failure is difficult. We don't have a definition yet. But despite he his continued progression, which we anticipate, we continued therapy. So key aspects that you want to keep in mind with your patients is do a thorough evaluation. Rule out all those things that may suggest an alternative diagnosis in your patient. Discuss, teach, educate, and include your patients in that treatment plan. They need to be a part of the decision, and they have choices. And consider a referral to an IPF center. We want to be there. We want to help be a part of that treatment plan. Um, all right, so for some of us that have been doing it a long time, we've seen this world drastically change uh, over the last few years, which is a good thing. Uh, and so this is not a hypothetical case. This is a case I saw last week. So this is a gentleman who is, uh, was diagnosed with IPF, 74 years old, meets, Kevin meets the criteria for age and traction and so on, uh, has been on, uh, in this case, profenadone for the last uh, six months, and his FVC has dropped by 14.5%, his DL by 17.2%. All right, guys, what do you want to do with this? That's the question is, now what? And as Lisa pointed out, I, I don't know what the answer is to that now what. Uh, it is uh, unclear to me exactly what the, the op optimal approach is. My challenge has been to discuss clinical trials. I've been doing clinical trials in this disease for decades. Uh, and so it is heartening to see this type of a list, which are studies that are actively recruiting patients Kevin, you'll remember this. If we had done this 10 years ago, there were like three things up here, and then they would have been IPF net studies. And so this is a drastically different approach, which is a good. This is a good thing to see. Uh, and in fact, there have been a series of relatively recent studies that have closed enrollment. Some are continuing to follow patients. You see them on the top. And some have read out. This is an IL-13 targeted approach that read out recently. It's in the Blue Journal uh, in press, I think it is already. Um, and there's another IL-13 targeted therapy that should be reading out soon, so interesting studies. The Fibrogen study actually was an interesting phase two study that had a positive result. So this is going to be another sort of TGF-focused therapeutic intervention that will be promising. I suspect there will be a larger phase three study being proposed at some point in the near future. Uh, this is an NIH-sponsored trial that Kevin and I were involved in which is a study that actually uh, didn't meet its primary endpoint, but had some very interesting components in terms of study design. It's an inhalational therapy. And so a lot of motion, a lot of things that are developing, uh, because I've become convinced, my oncology colleagues have convinced me, that this field is likely to be a field that will be dependent on combination therapy. So this is Toby Maher's editorial on the InJourney study. And so the question I think that all of us will have to wrestle with, it's a good question to wrestle with, is what of many therapeutic approaches, therapeutic options, we're likely to choose for individual patients. I suspect if we do this two years from now, it's going to be very different than what we're talking about now, which for some of us is drastically different than what we did three years ago. So the combination approach is going to evolve. I chose this first because the left-hand study is a study that Kevin Flaherty and I have been wrestling with for the last couple of years. This is a study of add-on therapy that is an NHLBI-sponsored trial. It is a study based on the concept that the lung microbial community and the associated host response has been associated by two independent groups, one in the US, the other in the UK. 
Very strong results. There's a paper in the Blue Journal that demonstrates this link extremely well. There are two of them, actually, two companion papers. And so there is, in the US, an antimicrobial therapy trial. In the UK, a partner antimicrobial therapy trial. Now, the approach that we've specifically taken in the cleanup study is, is unique in many ways. It's an interesting combination therapy with a relatively simple, well-tolerated, and expensive therapy. But it also has a whole series of interesting components. So the, the components include that it is a modified pragmatic study design. So instead of being a very rigorous study design where you have external reads of biopsies or imaging, it is local diagnosis. And it includes a broad range of patients, including a broad range of people with comorbid illnesses. So you understand that it's a broadly encompassing group of patients. The, the patient is actually given a prescription. Initially, we weren't going to even give that. It was going to be completely pragmatic. So we actually give a voucher so the patient doesn't have to pay for this. It's a large network of sites, not just IPF specialty sites, but there are a whole series of community sites as well. It has limited follow-up visits. It's a low burden for the patient and the site. It has an endpoint of disease progression characterized as lack of respiratory hospitalization or mortality. It's not a physiological primary endpoint. It has patient reports, data that are obtained in a relatively unintrusive fraction. It is randomized, but again, it's a broadly applicable group of patients with an ITT analysis. I show you all this because as you see what is occurring in the IPF field, it's gonna be combination therapy. And the way we test that in this case is broadly encompassing subjects, broad range of patients in a pragmatic study design. There are other approaches to combination therapy. So two of which relate to the drugs that Lisa mentioned in her presentation. Nintendib and Profenor, there have been one that's a Roche-sponsored trial, one that's a Berninger-sponsored trial. But they're both combination treatments, one 24 weeks, one 12 weeks. I'll show you the published one in a second because I accepted that to the Blue Journal recently. These are both studies to try to document tolerability, the ability of mixing these two agents together. So the paper in the Blue Journal, which is the Injourney study, is a combination with the standard doses. As I said, it's a relatively short study. It's a 12-week study. It's really meant to see can you actually mix these together and in fact, here's the scoop. So if you follow the number of patients screened, the number that were treated, the number that were randomized, and you go left, combination right, Nintendo alone, a couple of things pop up. And that is there's a differential dropout that occurs in the combination therapy arm. So that number of 34 at the bottom left is lower than 42. And that's in part for reasons that should not surprise you. And that is, there is incremental gastrointestinal toxicity when you mix drugs that have independent gastrointestinal toxicity. And so there's quite a bit more nausea. There's more vomiting. There was more fatigue. Does this mean that these combinations should not take place? My own personal view is no, but they should be done within the context of a clinical trial. <laughs> I'm biased in that respect. There were hints of physiology, but remember, this is, this is a very short-term study. This is a study that was really a study of tolerability, not a study of efficacy. There is ongoing discussion by the companies involved of joining together and trying to do, to do a larger combination study designed to test not only the components of tolerance, but also potential efficacy. I think I am fully supportive of that kind of a study. For the time being, I'm not sure exactly how well these two drugs are going to be uh, tolerated in mixing, but it does highlight the concept of combination therapy. The future in IPF is likely going to be combination therapy, and my own bias is going to be targeted combination therapy based on relevant biological pathways for individual patients. Here's an example of industry trying to design a therapeutic trial based on the concept of combination therapy. So this is PBI 4050 four, tested with alone or in combination with the currently approved drugs. And so this was actually presented recently, presented at the ATS. Not that it's a groundbreaking study, it's in a relatively small sort of proof of concept study, 
but it highlights what is likely going to be the case within industry for future therapeutic development, and that is you're going to have to understand that the baseline patient, the majority of those patients, are likely going to be on one of the two approved therapies. And so as you design therapeutic trials of a lot of those novel agents that you saw in earlier slides, it'll have to be within the construct of combination to those drugs, and the analytical plan is going to have to take into account the underlying drugs that are being taken and the incremental effect of combination therapy. So again, the concept here is not for you to look at all of those numbers and take notes and write down, oh, it's minus 12 versus minus 1 and 2. It's the concept of combination therapy in IPF will be the future within the next three to four years. You watch. One of the concepts that's gotten a lot of traction in the press, and the lay press in particular, is the idea of stem cell therapy. And what an exciting component. That, that may well work out. We're very, very, very early in the concept of what type of progenitor cells to use, how they're going to be provided to the patient, under, one, under what construct. This is Marilyn Glassberg's attempt. And I like this because it was, it's been done in a rigorous fashion. This is a safety study of mesenchymal stem cells that are being provided to patients in a dose escalation format. No dramatic tolerance problems, no major change in physiology, at least in such a small sample size, but the proof of concept of this type of therapy is beginning. This is going to be a while. It may be efficacious. It will likely again be in combination. Lisa, you pointed out the, the important component of reflux. And for those of you that read the IPF, uh, the ATS ERS ALAT JRS statement on therapy in IPF in 2015, you should read at the end of the document this little box by Kevin Wilson, who is the documents editor for the ATS, to highlight the controversy and complexity of the recommendation of reflux therapy within that guideline. There were several of us that were going to drop out of the guideline because of the recommendation that was made. It was very controversial with regards to whether reflux should be routinely treated in all IPF patients. I don't know the answer to that. But I will tell you this study, which is a study that Ganesh and Hal Collard have been running, which is a surgical therapy for reflux in IPF patients, we'll be reading out shortly. This original study was not a surgical therapy study. It was a study of a PPI. And that study had to be altered at the last moment. When the ATS guideline made a recommendation that PPI should be routinely used, we had to change completely the study design to make it a surgical study design. Nevertheless, I think when you see these results, they may or may not confirm what Ganesh has been suspicious of for a long time. I suspect he'll be proven correct and that reflux, in fact, will be an important component of the combination therapy structure that we take to our IPF patients. I'll end with studies that are ongoing or soon to begin in other ILDs. And I think these are particularly relevant for the following construct. So I'm going to show you nintednib studies just listed. They're clinicaltrials.gov down below. And the profenadone studies in the next slide. So there's a study of, in nintednib and LAM. The second study, which is one that Flaherty has been a key investigator in, which is a study in individuals with progressive fibrosing ILDs. I run the DSMB, so I am conflicted in that respect, because I think that's a really important study, as is the bottom study. So Kevin, you and I have spent years looking at the diagnostic process in the ILDs diagnose IPF. If all of these studies are positive, particularly the latter two studies, and it demonstrates that in this slide, nintendum is effective across a broad range of patients with fibrosing ILDs, a lot of these arguments that we've been having for years regarding, oh, the MDD, make like, sure it's a honeycombing or is it probable, becomes moot because we're going to be using the same therapeutic approaches. Same thing goes for the profenadone studies. So there's a study in scleroderma, patients with RAILD, fibrotic HP, progressive unclassifiable ILD. So again, the theme is the same, and that is these particular studies, if they're positive, we'll see, these are all ongoing or soon to begin, may drastically alter. Even the first presentation that you make in future of these programs 
because the idea of differential diagnosis may become a little bit less relevant. I'm not sure completely irrelevant, because I still think from a transplant point of view that becomes an important construct. There are clear studies of other agents in connective tissue-associated disease, studies that are about to begin or recruiting. So think about this. In context of what we had a few years ago, we now have approved drugs in IPF that clearly have efficacy, a series of studies of combination therapies in IPF, and a broad range of additional studies of a variety of top of attempts, whether they're antifibrotic or anti-inflammatory approaches, that's likely going to radically alter, in a good way, what we're doing for our patients five years from now. It's going to be a totally different field than it is now. There are numerous clinical trials ongoing. So Lisa, I will, one of your last points in one of your slides, which is, please consider referring to an IPF center. Part of the reason I'm biased, I'm at an IPF center, spent 23 years at another IPF center, is that all of these studies that are ongoing are ongoing at these IPF centers. All of those studies are going to be crucial. They're going to completely alter what we do therapeutically. And so recommending consideration of therapeutic trials, I think, is important. Combination will be the future. Your aid, on behalf of all of our patients, I think is what's required because this is going to be a radically different field in at least a five-year window, if not shorter, as it is now compared to three years ago. So um, several questions here. Thank you. Um, so Lisa, I'll ask you first. Um, there's a question on sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Does obstructive sleep apnea contribute to the development of pulmonary fibrosis, or does it worsen pre-existing fibrosis? So. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's it, why I gave it to you. Right. Theor <laughs> theoretically, it could be a little both. We don't know. We're on just the very early trying to sort this out in the association relationship. The prevalent theories have to do with um, possibly exacerbating reflux um, from stretch of the lung. The majority of um, stretch occurs at the edge of the lung. And in the situation of hypopneas with hyperpneas, we're in an understretch, overstretch situation that occurs repetitively off and on during the night when the upper airway is intermittently occluded. So all those things could come into play. Um, it could be that this, you know, which came first, the chicken or egg, we don't know. Great, thank you. Um, and this relates to the cleanup study and antimicrobials. So to paraphrase the question, other uh, antimicrobials such as macrolides have been used in other diseases. Um, you know, how about those in IPF uh, as well? And then also, do you worry uh, if we do long-term antimicrobial therapy about things like C. diff and, and other off-target complications of, of the antibiotics? Yeah, so I mean, uh, those are excellent questions. So Kevin refers to my experience in the COPD world. So in the U.S. there was an NIH-sponsored trial called the MACRO study, which was a year-long azithromycin study in COPD, which clearly demonstrated incremental effects in exacerbation reduction and clearly was associated with antimicrobial resistance. There's no doubt that that occurred with that agent. There actually is a Japanese study that's been published of azithro in acute exacerbations of IPF, interestingly enough. Uh, and so whether that particular agent will have relevance, I think, will be dependent on future trials. We chose the agents that we chose because they were already be had been demonstrated in earlier trials to have a potential clinical effect. So there's already a randomized control trial of Bactrim with uh, showing uh, potential benefit. That was part of the reason that agent was chosen. It was also chosen because both the U.S., here are all investigators in the COMET study that led to this, and in the U.K., the antimicrobial, uh, or the microbial changes in the lung community were such that you really needed to have drugs that had gram-positive activity. And so we chose drugs that had previous experience, in the U.S., it's Bactrim versus doxycycline. That's what we're testing, both of those. In the U.K., it's essentially it's a, it's a Bactrim study, a cotrimoxazole study. Uh, and with the understanding that there is, as always, potential risk and benefit, the risks of this approach are GI toxicity, C. diff, although neither of those two agents have a lot of C. diff associated with it. But as you know, the standard therapies do have GI toxicity, and there's a question as to whether using a, a long-term antimicrobial agent will enhance those. We'll find out. That's why you need randomized controlled trials. And Kevin, it's, it's actually the first study, after many times of the NIH convincing us to do this, 
that we're actually collecting poop in a randomized controlled trial on IPF. <laughs> and so, in part, that is to look at changes in gut flora as a, as a mechanism or as a safety monitor. We have no idea whether it's going to work. These are all investigators in the study that are sitting on your, ta on your uh, podium up here. But this is why you need randomized controlled trials. Again, goes back to Lisa's uh, plea, which I must completely agree with. There is an incremental advantage of having patients of yours evaluated at IP, IPF centers because we're involved in these studies that are likely going to alter the future of how this disease is managed. So Lisa, question about um, experience with these drugs uh, with weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, is it associated with the diarrhea, the nausea, decreased appetite? Um, so your thoughts on, have you seen a lot of weight loss? If it's there, how do you address it? What's your approach to that? Right. Um, certainly you do see it. I think I see it probably more in my um, uh, elderly, lower weight females than I do in any other po population. That's just completely anecdotal. But, um, and I found uh, you can manage these with dose reduction, uh, making sure that they're taking in enough food that they're eating uh, with their medications. Sometimes people need to go on uh, medication holidays and then re-challenge. I've certainly taken people off drug for a couple of weeks, put them back on it and a slow titration up and that seems to have helped. Um, because sometimes there are concurrent issues going on that may have been the culprit and kind of aggravating the side effects of the medication. Great, thanks. Fernando, how much of an FVC decline would you consider as significant? Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I say that because Kevin will be familiar with this. There was a, uh, an ongoing raging debate for many years regarding FVC as, an, as a surrogate, which it is, and the regulatory bodies admit that it's a surrogate, uh, and what level of decrease uh, is considered clinically significant. So Flaherty, when he was a fellow, published one of the original studies in this uh, field, uh, which suggested that a 10% threshold over a three and a six month time frame were predictive of, of uh, clinical outcomes subsequently. It was actually in a blue journal issue where there was a separate paper with the same conclusions from the University of Colorado and one from the Brompton, from uh, Imperial College in the UK. And so, and, and there have been multiple studies since then, including one of the FDA recently using the placebo arms of the recent uh, perfenidone and intendum studies, again suggesting that a 10% threshold in a population basis is considered to be a significant decrease. However, there have been a series of investigators, including investigators recently doing home spirometry, that are suggesting that there may be lower components, lower thresholds, including 5%, that may prove to be clinically relevant. I still remain somewhat concerned regarding that because part of the reason we use FBC and we've used FBC as a surrogate is that it is easy to measure and has a relatively tight coefficient of variation. But that coefficient of variation is on the order of three to five percent. So I'm always hesitant to make individual patient decisions when you've got changes of five percent. That's just above what your lab can do if you have a really good, well-trained uh, technician doing your, uh, your testing on the same machine. So I, I'm still holding to, for an individual, a 10 percent threshold I still consider to be the, the threshold that's likely most predictive and reproducible. Kevin, what do you think? You published this stuff. Yeah, I was gonna ask you another question that wasn't here, but it, it goes to that reproducibility, and we're measuring them at three months or six months. What about home spirometry? Yeah, so home spirometry is being advocated by two groups. Toby Maher, who's at Imperial College, and Hal Collard at uh, UCSF. Uh, the most advanced of those data are the ones from Imperial College, the paper that we took to the Blue Journal last year, from Toby and his uh, ongoing cohort study in the UK. Uh, and there is an, a value to more measurements in that you get a better sense of what slopes look like. We, we were at a meeting recently, Kevin, that you and I saw, saw some of the, the how sausage gets made uh, <laughs> component. Uh, and it's clear that the, the amount of compliance that the patient has with this starts to drop after a, after a few months. Uh, I suspect that home spirometry will be valuable in early stages of therapeutic development. I doubt that it's going to be something we'll be using routinely in clinical care. Keith, you're a transplant kind of guy. You remember when we were doing home spirometry in transplant patients? And, and you guys still routinely do home spirometry in your post-transplant patients? We don't do it anymore. Why? 
That's why I ask. <laughs> because we did the same thing. It just didn't seem to help much. And to be honest with you, it's sort of what you see, Lisa, you, I'm just, I saw your oxygenation issue up there. When you send patients home with a home oximeter, and they sit there and measure their, ox their oxygen saturation. And I don't know about you, but I mean, I've had patients who have become obsessed with, oh my God, my SAT is 88% and it was 89 yesterday. And, and my, my suspicion on an individual patient level is that home spirometry has variation. Mm -hmm. And it's probably more variable in the setting when you don't have a good expiration that's being coached by a pulmonary function tech. And so that I do not, long-winded answer, Kevin, I don't believe that this is ready for, for prime time in our clinical use. It will likely be used in some therapeutic development for proof of concept studies. But I don't think that's, that's gonna be something we'll be doing routinely in patients for a long time. And in the transplant world, we stopped doing it and we did this years ago. Great, so there's a, a couple questions uh, that relate to the potential use of natentative or profenadone in other fibrotic lung diseases, things associated with rheumatoid arthritis or other connective tissue disease. Remember, they're approved to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And as Fernando mentioned, there are numerous trials going on for both agents to look, do they actually work in other fibrotic lung diseases? So my strong recommendation would be, yes, consider these drugs in IPF, but if they don't have IPF, they have other fibrotic lung diseases, try to get these patients to a center where they could be considered for a clinical trial so we can figure out if it works, because we don't know. Uh, but there's at least a lot of interest in, in studying that. So refer your patients for possible studies. They have other types of fibrotic lung diseases. Uh, Lisa, along kind of those same lines, a question uh, about looking for underlying autoimmune diseases. So your initial evaluation is negative. Mm -hmm. What's your approach going forward? Do you check serologies at certain intervals, six months, a year? Do you wait until symptoms come up? Do you have a kind of recommendation in terms of how often you look for things beyond that initial visit? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think definitely you want to do a thorough evaluation. Put that time in up front. You don't have to do everything in the first visit. Sometimes it takes a second visit to kind of get all your data together and to make your diagnosis, but that is an ongoing evaluation and evolution. Um, looking for signs and symptoms of autoimmune disease really at each visit because sometimes it can present with the interstitial lung disease first and then later on probably more characteristically in males with rheumatoid arthritis this symmetric synovitis can later on present. Um, the other little caveat is you can have ANA uh, negative patients with autoimmune disease namely antisynthetase syndrome, and that's a difficult one and easy to miss. I have a low threshold now, probably lower now than in the past for looking for red flags of uh, high titers of serologies. Getting help from my rheumatologists that are interested in interstitial lung disease, and we're beginning to get more information on the um, idiopathic pneumonitis with autoimmune features. Uh, more studies are being done. Actually, we have a f uh, fellow that's beginning to work on that and try to understand those features and potential markers uh, for that very interesting uh, subset of patients. Awesome. All right, we have 30 seconds. So, Fernando, I'm going to give you the last question. As a lead investigator in the Panther study, which showed the effects of increased hospitalizations and mortality with azathioprine yeah. um, combined with, with n acetylcysteine So this question is your view on mycophenolate in the treatment of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Oh, I think that uh, Kevin, uh, actually all three of us were involved in the, in the Panther study. Uh, I do not believe there is currently a role for any type of immunosuppressive therapy in well-defined IPF. That's not necessarily reflect the connective tissue associated disorders that Lisa just uh, talked about. Uh, and there are ongoing trials in very specific indications that is within therapeutic trials. You guys in the US paid for that study. We pained in providing the information that at least potent immunosuppressive therapy in well-defined IPF did not have a beneficial effect, and in fact, it was harmful. So I would not use it if I have a clear sense that there's IPF present. And I would agree, which is why I asked you that question. But though we, I think we all would agree <laughs> on that approach. Right. So. Hey, Kevin, can I ask him a question real quick? Yep. Sorry, guys, in the last, we're already 30 seconds over. But Lisa, this last point that you raised was something that's very interesting. And so we don't have audience response. I'm going to have you raise your hands to the following question. 
So Kevin, you and I are involved in the next version of the ATS guideline on IPF diagnosis. And you saw the controversy in responses regarding when you should get serological testing in a patient suspected of having IPF. The vote was split, like almost 50-50. I had to call in when you guys were in Europe to beg to break the tie. It was unbelievable. I couldn't <laughs> believe this. Thing. So how many in this audience, in the cases that these two demonstrated, whether it was Joe or Brian, in those two cases, how many of you would routinely check a panel of rheumatological markers on that patient? That is exactly the distribution we had yeah, in the ATS statement. Yeah. It was 50-50. It was interesting to see. Lisa, do you routinely check all those? Um, I routinely. can't say Just routine. Order a panel. Not 100% of the time. I think as you get older in age, it's probably less likely in the in 80s or um, even sometimes the 90s that we see. But um, pro I think my threshold is lower than it used to be 10, 15 years ago. Interesting. For that, I think, because I do wonder um, about that interesting subset with autoimmune features that is out there. All right, thank you. I'm glad thank at least we're not completely much. crazy. Fernando, Lisa, thanks. Thanks. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash czm. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals Incorporated.